Welcome to Stellar Insights, where we um, take these complex topics and we kind of break them down into something a little more manageable. And uh, today we're going to be diving into the world of the Apollo moon missions. Specifically, how did they actually navigate to the moon and how did that onboard computer actually work? Well, it is, uh, it's a fascinating story, uh, one that really showcases the efforts of, you know, almost half a million people and the innovative technology they developed. It's really mind-boggling to think about the sheer scale of the Apollo program. I mean, we were talking about 400,000 people working towards this single goal of landing humans on the moon. And, you know, in order to achieve that goal, the planning process was incredibly meticulous. They had these detailed guides called mission techniques that outlined every single step that was needed to accomplish the mission objectives. And uh, they even had something called a data priority decision process to determine what information was absolutely essential for the mission's success. I can't even imagine needing a manual for landing on the moon. That must have been one heck of a document to have sitting on a bookshelf somewhere. And uh, let's not forget about the technological marvel that made it all possible, the Apollo guidance computer. Now, it is important to remember that this computer was incredibly primitive compared to what we have today. It was groundbreaking for its time, a true pioneer in computing history, but it had less processing power than a modern day calculator. That's unbelievable. And this computer itself was made up of three major components. You had the computer itself, the DSKY, pronounced DISKY, and the IMU. The DSKY acted as the interface for the astronauts, allowing them to interact with the computer by inputting commands and receiving data. So basically the DSKY was like the keyboard and the display all rolled into one. And what about the IMU? Ah, uh, the IMU or inertial measurement unit was like a combination of a compass and a speedometer for the spacecraft. It used these gyroscopes and accelerometers to determine the spacecraft's position and its velocity as it hurtled through the vast emptiness of space. That level of precision just seems absolutely crucial when you're trying to reach a target that's, you know, almost a quarter of a million miles away. Absolutely. Navigating in space requires this precise understanding of the spacecraft's state vector, which includes its location, velocity, and direction of travel at any given time. So it's kind of like a cosmic GPS in a way. Yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. The IMU was constantly measuring the spacecraft's acceleration and sending that data to the computer, which then updated that state vector, ensuring they knew exactly where they were and where they were going. But, you know, space is full of, well space and a lot can go wrong. So how did they account for those challenges? Well, one of the most important safety measures that they had was uh, the use of what's called a free return trajectory. And this was essentially a planned flight path that would allow the spacecraft to swing around the moon and return back to Earth, even if the engine failed. So kind of like a built-in safety net just in case. Exactly. They understood that in space, redundancy and safety were absolutely paramount. And even with the free me turn trajectory, there was still a constant need for course correction because even slight movements within the spacecraft could affect its trajectory. Not to mention they had to constantly consider the gravitational pull of the moon itself. Precisely. The moon's gravity has this significant influence on any spacecraft in its vicinity. And this meant the astronauts, particularly the command module pilot, played a crucial role in navigation. So they weren't just passengers on this trip. Not at all. They had to undergo rigorous training in simulators to prepare for navigating around the moon, which presented some of its own unique challenges. The lunar horizon, for instance, is much more jagged and irregular than the Earth's, making it harder to use for visual navigation. So they had to rely on other methods as well, I take it? Yes. They used a sextant for celestial navigation, taking star sightings to refine the spacecraft's position, much like sailors did for centuries before them. And uh, there's actually a famous story about Jim Lovell, the command module pilot on Apollo 8. He was known for his exceptional navigation skills. He even earned the nickname, the navigator par excellence. It must have been a natural. He was. And his skills were put to the test when he accidentally reset the IMU during the mission. It was a, uh, quite a tense moment, but it just highlights how crucial human expertise was, even in such a technologically advanced system. So we talked about the computer and the astronauts, but how did they actually communicate with this relatively primitive machine? That's where the DSKY came in, right? Exactly. The DSKY allowed the astronauts to interact with the computer using a very specific language that was made up of verbs and nouns. For instance, if they wanted to change the spacecraft's velocity, they would use the verb change and the noun velocity. Ah, so it was kind of like a simplified code for giving instructions to the computer. Precisely. 
the astronauts input those commands via the DSKY, and the computer responded by displaying data and confirmations on these numeric displays. Sounds incredibly intricate. It was. And then there's this fascinating concept of what's called the RE-FSM mat. It's a specific orientation in space that the guidance platform could be aligned to. What was the purpose of that? Well, think of it as a reference point, a way to simplify the monitoring of all those crucial maneuvers, things like engine burns or course corrections. By aligning the platform to the RE-FSM mat, the crew could instantly tell if the spacecraft was pointing in the right direction. I see. So it was kind of like setting a compass heading, but in the vastness of space. That's a, that's a great analogy. And choosing the correct RE-FSM mat was absolutely vital, especially during these complex maneuvers. So we're starting to understand how this intricate dance between human skill and really cutting edge technology made navigating to the moon possible. And we've only just begun to scratch the surface. There's so much more to uncover about this incredible feat of engineering and human determination. And uh, selecting the appropriate RE-FSM mat for each maneuver was absolutely critical. It was kind of like choosing the right tool for the job. And, uh, you know, using the wrong one could have complicated navigation significantly. It really must require an incredible amount of mental agility on the part of those astronauts. I mean, they were essentially flying a computer while simultaneously making these split-second decisions based on, you know, these really complex calculations. It really was an incredible feat of skill and concentration, especially when you consider they were doing all of this in a cramped spacecraft traveling at thousands of miles per hour. Let's talk about the journey itself. How do they actually get from Earth orbit to lunar orbit? Well, the journey began with the massive Saturn V rocket, uh, a three-stage behemoth that was responsible for launching the Apollo spacecraft out of the Earth's gravitational pull. And I understand the third stage, the SIVB, played a pretty crucial role in setting them on course for the moon. That's right. After reaching Earth orbit, the SIVB engine would reignite to perform what's called the translunar injection, or TLI burn. And uh, this maneuver boosted the spacecraft's speed and placed it on a trajectory that would intersect with the moon's orbit. I imagine that must have been the moment when they were truly committed to the journey. No turning back. Precisely. The TLI burn was a pivotal moment. Uh, it set them on a course for the moon. And as we discussed earlier, they utilized that free return trajectory for safety, ensuring they could return to Earth even if the engine failed during this critical phase. It's fascinating how they incorporated this gravitational slingshot back home as a safety measure. It really speaks volumes about the emphasis on safety and the meticulous planning that went into these Apollo missions. But, you know, navigating to the moon wasn't as simple as just pointing the spacecraft in the right direction. The moon's own gravity had a significant influence on the spacecraft's trajectory, requiring constant adjustments along the way. So they had to make these regular course corrections throughout the journey. Exactly. Even minor variations in the engine burn or external factors could push the spacecraft off course. And uh, to maintain their trajectory, they relied on this combination of Earth-based tracking stations and onboard navigation techniques. We talked earlier about using the sextant for celestial navigation. Did they use any other methods to help pinpoint their location in space? Well, they also employed a technique called ranging, which utilized radio signals. Ground stations would send these radio signals to the spacecraft. And uh, by measuring the time it took for the signal to return, they could calculate the spacecraft's distance from Earth. So it's kind of similar to how GPS works today. There are definitely some similarities there, yeah. By analyzing the Doppler shift of those radio signals, they could also determine the spacecraft's velocity, basically telling them if the spacecraft was moving towards or away from Earth and at what speed. So we've covered the Saturn V launch, the TLI burn, that free return trajectory, and these various navigation techniques. What about entering lunar orbit? How did that happen? Ah, uh, yes. Entering lunar orbit was another critical maneuver called the Lunar Orbit Insertion, or LOI. And uh, to achieve this, the spacecraft had to decelerate significantly, which was accomplished by firing the Service Propulsion System, or SPS engine, while on the far side of the moon. So out of contact with Earth. Yeah, for a short period during that burn, they were essentially flying blind relying entirely on the spacecraft systems and their calculations. That must have been a pretty tense moment for everyone involved. It was. It was truly a testament to the astronaut's skill and the reliability of the technology they had developed. But a successful LOI maneuver placed them into lunar orbit, uh, a significant step closer to their ultimate goal. Once in lunar orbit, what happened next? 
Well, the crew would then prepare for the next phase, which was separating the lunar module or LM from the command and service module. And uh, this was another complex procedure involving undocking the two spacecraft and preparing the LM for its descent to the lunar surface. The lunar landing itself is a whole other story. It's really a tale of engineering brilliance and human courage that deserves its own deep dive at some point. Indeed. The story of how they landed on the moon is as captivating as the journey to get there. You know, navigating to the moon, it really was a monumental achievement. It's really a testament to the incredible complexity and scale of the Apollo program. Oh, absolutely. It really showcases the dedication and the expertise of all those countless individuals who worked tirelessly behind the scenes to you know, push the boundaries of human ingenuity. We've uncovered the meticulous planning that was involved. The sophisticated technology like the Saturn V rocket and the Apollo guidance computer, and of course the absolutely pivotal role of those brave astronauts. Yeah, their courage and skill in piloting these complex machines through the vast expanse of space is really inspiring. From that powerful TLI burn that set them on their lunar course, yeah. to that delicate LOI maneuver that placed them into orbit around the moon, each step was just so critical. And, uh, and we can't forget about the ingenuity of that free return trajectory, you know, that safety net that really underscored their commitment to bringing those astronauts safely back to Earth. The story of Apollo navigation is really one of human innovation perseverance and this relentless drive to explore the unknown. It's a story that continues to inspire, you know, generations of scientists, engineers, and dreamers. It reminds us of what we can achieve when we set our sights on these truly ambitious goals. As we look ahead to the future of space exploration, the lessons learned from Apollo really serve as a guiding light. The challenges of navigating to even more distant destinations are going to be immense, mm -hmm. but Apollo has shown us what is possible when we dare to push the limits of human ingenuity. So as you contemplate the vastness of space and the incredible journey of those Apollo astronauts, consider this. Knowing the intricacies and precision that was involved in lunar navigation during the Apollo era, how will future missions adapt and refine these techniques for even more ambitious destinations? Perhaps we'll see autonomous navigation systems, you know, guided by artificial intelligence playing a larger role, or maybe the development of entirely new propulsion systems that enable faster and more efficient travel through the cosmos. Whatever the future holds, the legacy of Apollo navigation will continue to shape our understanding of what humanity can achieve in the realm of space exploration. Thanks for joining us for today's discussion. We hope you enjoyed diving into the topic as much as we did. If you found it interesting, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you won't miss future episodes. Let's keep exploring, learning, and sharing great conversations together. Until next time, take care and stay curious.